Hey there, Mr. Reddit here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled Parent Stories. Today we have a very special episode for you, a compilation of some of the greatest Entitled Parent Stories we read over the past year. So sit back, relax, and enjoy a few hours of the most Entitled Parents you've ever heard of. And by the way, Karen assured me that if this video gets 1000 likes, she won't try to speak to anyone's manager for an entire week. So please smash that like button. And if you're new, subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. And become an official member of the ReArmy today, and I'll give you a shout out in an upcoming video. R slash Entitled Parents. Entitled Mom Calls Police on Public Library, Gets Detained. Our cast. We've got me. We've got police officers one and two. We've got Entitled Mom. And we've got the good stepmom. This happened yesterday, and we have a meeting about it later today. I work for a library in a small rural town. We have a policy if anyone calls or comes in looking for someone, we're not allowed to tell them if they are here or not, or where they can find them. This is for cases if someone is looking to fight someone, or a random person is looking for a kid that may or may not be theirs. Now, with that logic in place, let's set the scene. I was working in circulation last night, and around 6 p.m., we get a call that I answer. Me. Hello, this is Anon County Library. How may I help you? Entitled Mom. Yes, I'm looking for my daughter. Gives a brief description of the kid. She should be there. She came in with another lady. Sorry, ma'am. We are not allowed to tell you who's here or not, as we cannot verify that you are who you claim to be. What? We cannot tell you if a kid is here, because we cannot verify you are the parent. What the heck? She pauses and gets distant. I hear her yell to somebody in the background. They won't tell if she's there, because they can't verify I'm the parent of my own dang daughter. She abruptly hangs up the phone. Since we're the only two there for closing for the night, I tell my coworker we might get an angry lady in looking for a kid she already knows we can't tell her anything. What's important is that she is at reference while I'm at circulation. She basically looks after study rooms and computer labs while I look at the stacks so no one can watch desk. And sure enough, Around 10 to 15 minutes later, Entitled Mom huffs into the place. Where is my daughter? This is a library, ma'am. You need to lower your voice, or you need to leave. And I told you on the phone, we are not allowed to tell you who is here. But you can have a look around. Entitled Mom. To tell me to lower my dang voice. I'm looking for my daughter, jerk. Now, where is she? Again, I cannot tell you. Now lower your voice and stop with the language or I will be forced to call the police to escort you out of the building. Little side note, our library is right next to the police station, like directly across, we're neighbors. Entitled mom gets quite a huffs around the place. We are not that big, so it takes about five minutes to look everywhere a patron can be. Once she finished, she comes back and this is where crap really hits the fan. I couldn't find my daughter out there. I'm gonna check back there. She points at the entrance to the staff only back room for desk workers. Me. Ma'am, you cannot go back there. There's only two of us working and I can't allow you back there in the first place. It could be a liability. My daughter could be back there. Unlikely as you have to have keys to open that door. Ma'am, the final answer is no. I'm gonna have to ask you to leave. You are being disruptive and disturbing the peace. No, I'm calling the police. You are holding my daughter hostage. What the? Entitled mom proceeds to actually call the police while I sit there dumbfounded. About five minutes later, Three police cars arrive for a retrieval of a kid who wasn't there. As they walk in, Entitled Mom started screeching. They have my daughter locked up in the back. 
and won't let her out. Police officer looks confused because we're a public library. So I have to explain what's happening and unlock the staff only for them to search just in case. Entitled mom smirks and says, Was that so hard, you idiot? Police officer too. Lady, there is no one back here. Do you know where your daughter was last? She was here last, and this jerk wouldn't tell me if she was here or not. Me. Our policy is, we can't tell you if someone is here, but you are free to look around. We do this to prevent people from looking for criminals or looking for a specific person to fight, or in the case of kids so they are not taken. We can't confirm you are the parent. Photos don't help because we don't know if they are not allowed to see the kid because of visitation issues from divorce or loss of custody. In this case, it was the very last option. The police officer just shakes her head. Police officer one. Did he tell you this already? Yes, but she starts to choke up. At this point, a woman and a girl walk in with snacks and a drink from the gas station a couple blocks down. The grandma started to yell. Grandma, why the heck are you here? Did you come here to see this kid? Are you insane? We have discussed this many times with the father. You can't be popping up trying to see the kid. But I miss my baby. I wanted to see her. You lost that right when you left her in a car to buy drugs and you disappeared for hours. You are lucky she is even here. Entitled mom starts to bawl. The officers split up and talk to grandma, while the others detain entitled mom to see if she needs to be arrested. Sadly, this is where it ends, as we're not told anything. But it was really crazy, and pretty fun. I mean, we get a lot of weird people who come in, but this was by far the most exciting. Next we've got, pair of entitled moms try to shut down a festival and pepper spray my boyfriend. This story starts yesterday afternoon with me and my boyfriend going to a Japanese cultural festival. The festival gets held every year at some kind of large temple slash cultural center, but this is my first time going. I've wanted to go for the past few years, but for one reason or another, something else always comes up that prevented me from going. So needless to say, I'm pretty excited to go now that the stars have perfectly aligned for me to go. There's all sorts of events and activities going on both in and outside the buildings when we arrive. Music, food, educational speakers, presentations, etc. And me and my boyfriend spend the day having a great time. Eventually, we end up at a booth that allows people to pay to take pictures in traditional Japanese attire. We both dress up in a yukata, and at the end, the person running the booth tells us if we would like to purchase our own kimonos or yakuta that they have a vendor that is selling them. I think it's pretty cool, so we go to check it out, and I end up purchasing one for me and my boyfriend, both of us putting them on right away. End up heading to go get some food when someone calls out to us with an, Excuse me? turn around and see two women with a kid. One of them is a white woman, entitled Mom 1, and the other appears to be Asian, entitled Mom 2. Both of them have obnoxiously brightly colored hair and are wearing F8 shirts, entitled Mom 1. Hi there, can I just ask if either of you are of Japanese descent? Me. I'm not, I'm not sure about him, I say jokingly. My boyfriend. No, I'm not. Entitled Mom 1. Well then, why do you feel like you have the right to wear that? Me. I don't understand. It's called cultural appropriation, and it's wrong. So you need to take those off and never wear them again. Boyfriend. Excuse me? Entitled Mom 2. It's just that if you aren't Japanese, you shouldn't be wearing those outfits. Japanese culture isn't your fashion statement. This keeps going on for about two minutes. The two seem to have a routine where Entitled Mom 1 is the aggressor 
constantly throwing out accusations and labels, while Entitled Mom 2 is just trying to guilt trip us. Entitled Mom 1 is getting angrier by the second. We try walking away at one point, but Entitled Mom 1 blocks our path. Don't walk away from me. The kid starts crying, probably because his mom just yanked the heck out of his arm and is screaming at strangers on a hot day. Now you're upsetting our son. My boyfriend. Please leave us alone. We bought these at the festival and you're being ridiculous. Staff members come over since this is starting to cause a scene. Entitled Mom 2 starts speaking to one of them, presumably in Japanese, while the other is stuck with Entitled Mom 1 berating them, telling them they should be ashamed of themselves, how they shouldn't allow things like this, etc. Meanwhile, Entitled Mom 2 says she's calling the police to shut down the festival. At this point, we try to get out of there. Entitled Mom 1 spots us trying to leave and tries to grab my boyfriend, who just knocks her hand away. Entitled Mom 1 suddenly pulls out pepper spray and sprays it at my boyfriend, getting him in the eyes. Shockingly, they don't stick around for when the police show up. They take our statement of what happened, but unfortunately, this place doesn't have security footage and nobody was recording the incident. We made it very clear that when they're found, that we wanted to press charges. But so far, we haven't heard anything. After that, we went over to the hospital to make sure that my boyfriend won't have any lasting eye damage. I'll keep this updated if anything changes. Update 1. No call from the cops, but boyfriend got a call from someone who is apparently a part of the people who run the event. He didn't ask how high up the chain they were, but the meat and bones of the conversation was they were calling to offer an apology that this happened at their event and to inform him that they would cooperate in whatever way possible with the investigation. They also told him that they would be making some changes regarding security and he seemed happy enough with the result. We'll keep posted for further developments. Next we've got Entitled Family Argues Over Cutting the Line and Calls the Cops Over a Toy That I Own my very entitled parent's story begins at a Costco. For those who aren't fully aware of what a Costco actually is, allow me to enlighten you with this knowledge. A Costco is basically Walmart, but everything is supersized, which for those who live in the UK, a supermarket, but with everything two to four times bigger. The inside is like a giant warehouse. This is for context and to understand the layout of the entire store. Usually at the checkout area, there is a food court where you can order a variety of foods. More on that later. Today's cast. We've got Entitled Mom. We've got Entitled Kid, about 6 to 7. We've got Entitled Dad, Entitled Uncle, Normal Aunt, Miss Supervisor, and Cool Officer. And me. Wait, why do I hear boss music? This story takes place about two weeks ago. So, as all those who live in the southern US or on the peninsula that is called Florida, there is this thing that's called hurricane season. It's a season where it's hot and rainy and muggy all at once and it can't be stopped. With all the hysteria of preparing for the impact of Hurricane Dorian, you can imagine how many people there were who were piling their carts high with supplies to be prepared for the weeks that were supposed to come without power and the amount of devastation that usually comes post-hurricane. It was a relatively normal day. I had expected things to go as normally as they could. We ended up getting the somewhat scraps of non-perishables and some supplies. By the time we had finished scavenging whatever is left over from the store, my mom, yes, I'm a college student who still lives with their parents, lame, had asked if we could stop by a McDonald's and grab a bite. I was hesitant at first because I still wanted to check around the store for any extra supplies we can use to barricade or find any more non-perishables, and that's when I spot the food court. My mom asks me if I wanted to check out the food court, so we buy our supplies and we wheel our cart just outside of the food court. 
I get a glance at the menu from afar, and I ask my mom what she wants so I can get it and leave. There's a long line of people waiting for their meals. I try to pass the time by playing on my Tamagotchi and looking around. As the line gets shorter, I look up to see a family of four people who weren't there before. Taking notice of this, I clear my throat. Me to Entitled Dad and Entitled Mom Excuse me, you just cut the line in front of me. Entitled Dad and Entitled Mom ignore me. Me, again, but a little louder. Hey, you guys just cut in front of me. I was here first. Entitled Mom turns around. Entitled Mom Um, no, you were standing around. We got in line, and now you're saying we cut you? Entitled Dad and Entitled Uncle hear the commotion and turn around. Entitled Dad tells Entitled Mom, Sugar Bear, what's the big idea? Entitled Mom, This lady thinks we cut her in the line. She says it while raising her voice. I don't know what you're trying to do or say to my wife, but you better stop. Entitled Uncle is just watching all of this while Entitled Mom flashes me a smug grin. I just shrug it off at first, trying to get back to tending to my Tamagotchi Bobby, when suddenly I hear Entitled Mom and Entitled Dad look at each other and then whisper something to Entitled Kid. The line then moves up a little as another satisfied person leaves with their food. They didn't move up the line and instead Entitled Kid walks behind them. I'm trying my best to focus on my digital pet when suddenly Entitled Kid is standing in front of me. Entitled Kid tells me, My mommy and daddy told me I could have that toy. Now give it to me. Me. No, it was a gift. Bye. Entitled Kid. No, give me that toy now. Mummy. Entitled Mom snaps neck at 1.39 mock. Simplified really freaking fast. Entitled Mom. What did you say to my precious baby girl? Entitled Kid. She took my toy. How dare you? How dare me? How dare you? You tell your kid to take something from me? She's just trying to play with her toy and you ripped it out of her precious hands. Entitled Uncle finally says something while most of the cafeteria goers and some staff are looking on. Entitled Uncle. It's true. I saw her. Someone call the cops. Entitled Dad. You should be ashamed of yourself, blaming your crimes on an innocent girl. I start shaking as I begin to panic. It wasn't true. I could feel tears forming in my eyes as I watch as Entitled Mom takes my precious toy away. I'm not a very confrontational person, and I don't like being yelled at. Past issues. Entitled Mom. Besides, a fatty like you shouldn't be playing with toys or eating fast food. You should be exercising and eating right. As soon as I started panicking, I looked up in my blur of tears as a woman in the infamous red shirt had come by to see the commotion. Ponytail up, uniform in check. My hero. She walks into the cafeteria, talks to one of the cashiers, who had called the incident in, and she points to the entitled family. Supervisor briskly walks over to us. Supervisor. Hello, I'm blank blank. I'm a supervisor for this section of Costco. I heard over the radio that one of my cashiers was having trouble with a few customers. Can you tell me what's wrong? Entitled uncle. This piece of crap stole that toy away from my niece and wouldn't give it back. Entitled dad. She then continued to berate us and tell us that we cut her in the line when she clearly was just standing around. Entitled Mom nods in agreement. Miss Supervisor. And do you have proof that you own the toy? Entitled Mom looks at Supervisor, then me, then begins to look in her absurdly large tote bag while Entitled Dad comforts Entitled Kid and Entitled Uncle stutters before he falls onto one detail of my Tamagotchi the hand-painted stars on the outer shell. Entitled Uncle The white paint on the toy. I remember my niece and I painting it just before we left the house. Just today. It's acrylic paint and layered. 
me. Wouldn't it be fresh paint though? The paint I used on my toy was spray paint, you idiot. You could see the eerie anger that was building up in all three of them. I'm shaking from this. Miss Supervisor. Well, if she did take the toy, as you said before, we can just review the camera footage. It should clear it all up. Come on. I and the rest of the entitled family, clap clap, follow Miss Supervisor to the front of the store where we wait for an officer to come and resolve this dispute. About 10 minutes later, an officer shows up and Miss Supervisor tells the story. She then leads the officer to God knows where. I try to separate myself from the small group by standing five to eight feet away from them. I'm shaking and panicking because I've never had any interaction with the police, let alone be accused of a robbery. If you've never had an encounter with an officer, it's scary. I just wanted my pizza, man. 20 minutes go by and the officer comes out to where entitled dad, entitled uncle, entitled kid, entitled mom, and I are waiting. During these 20 minutes, the entitled family shooting me nasty looks. Supervisor and officer approached us and tell entitled dad. Officer, well, I reviewed the footage and she's right. He points to me. Entitled dad, that's impossible. That toy is officer. Shut up and let me finish. She came into the store with the toy as well. You cut in front of the line. She was in front of you. Entitled mom. But that's not fair. The video footage had to be lying. Entitled uncle was red in the face as entitled dad and entitled kid watched on. Entitled mom then marched over to a trash can and grabbed an empty bottle of soda and threw it at the officer. Officer. That's it. Turn around. Wh what Ma'am, you're being arrested for assault on an officer and disturbing the peace. Turn around and make my job easier. Entitled mom then tries to run away, but was tackled by the officer, who was then face planted into the damp concrete outside the store. The entitled mom was in hysteria, saying that it was all a setup and pointing at me while screaming, I'll be seeing you in court. Entitled uncle and entitled dad ended up with a fine while I had to talk with the supervisor, a manager, and the police officer to tell them what happened. I ended up leaving two hours later. Oh, and my mom? She was roaming the jeans section of Costco. I never got a notice to appear in court. After the whole ordeal, I met normal aunt in the parking lot of Costco. She was right across from my parked car. I was still shaking and was about to enter my car when she shouts, Hey, you there! I turn around, see a woman in her mid-thirties jogging over to my car. I'm entitled uncle's younger sister. I'm sorry I didn't get to stand up for you earlier. I didn't want to bother you, but I know my brother, entitled uncle, can be a jerk. Me. Uh, thanks. I gotta go now. She nods and runs back to her car and drives off. I get in and go home to prepare for a hurricane that is about to miss us by a landslide. Karen wants $1,000 cash for $10 coupon sent to wrong address pays more in legal fees. This story is from a few years ago when I worked in the legal department of a 1000 plus store national retailer. As part of my job, I handled customer complaints that elevated when the customer threatened legal action. Our customer service call center forwarded Karen's call to me after she threatened legal action. Karen left a message claiming that she was not provided $10 in customer reward coupons, spend $200, receive a $10 coupon in the mail sort of thing. This was before apps. Based on her purchase of clothing for her son and daughter for back to school. I looked into it and called Karen back. It turned out we had an old address associated with her rewards account. No big deal, right? I spoke with Karen and offered to send her the original $10 coupon and an additional $25 for her trouble to correct the address. That did not satisfy Karen. She claimed we should have known her address and threatened to sue us if we didn't pay her $1,000 in cash. 
Her rationale was that it would cost us at least $1,000 to defend the suit. She was in a state in which our company did not have any offices, so we should just pay it to her. I declined, but still forwarded her the $10 coupon she was entitled to pursuant to our rewards program. Sure enough, she sued us for breach of contract, fraud, and any other conceivable charge. I went to my boss, the COO, and told him the story. He asked what I wanted to do. I said I'd rather pay legal fees to a defense attorney than pay Karen and he agreed. I contacted outside counsel, our awesome attorney, explained the situation to him, and I kid you not, he said in a southern drawl, I get to sue Karen? I should be paying you guys. There are a lot of lawyers in this legal community who would love to sue her, as she is reckless, unpleasant, and a total pain in the butt to deal with. I'll gladly take your case. He agreed to defend us at a reduced rate. Part of our defense strategy was to countersue her under the state's frivolous lawsuit statute, which would move the suit from small claims court to the larger civil court. Awesome attorney filed our answer and counterclaim. Although Karen was an attorney, she was not a defense attorney, so she had to engage her own attorney to defend against the counterclaim. After a couple of hearings, she offered to settle for no more money exchanged. She didn't even get the extra $25 coupon I offered her and the dismissal of both suits. I talked with Awesome Attorney about continuing our claim, but he advised it would probably be worth settling and being done with it rather than being vindictive. Although vindictive would have been fun, courts tend not to like that, so I agreed. My company ended up paying Awesome Attorney $900 in attorney's fees. Awesome Attorney later called and told us that the attorney Karen engaged charged her $1,700 to defend the suit. Although I would have liked to continue with our suit, I think her having to pay $1,700 over a $10 coupon sent to the wrong address is sufficient justice. Next we've got Don't Screw With The Crew. Back in the early 90s, I got a gig working as a front of house sound engineer on a major 10 day music and arts festival in London's Docklands with some 15 stages dotted all around the waterfront. All of the crew working the stages were either experienced theater techs and or had loads of experience working major outside events, which is the reason we were hired. As an aside, this festival was to celebrate the culmination of a massive investment in the redevelopment of this area of East London, itself the former site of one of the largest dock complexes in the world. I was tasked with running FOH sound on one of the largest stages. Normally, events like this are loads of fun to work, but within two days, it became apparent that the organizers had one no idea how to run major outside events, and two, had not the faintest idea of how to book acts and schedule same. In particular, we also had to contend with some woman from Docklands' middle management team who had been given the job of overseeing our particular stage. A person who not only had rapidly proved to be totally ignorant of any aspect of managing outside events, but also someone for whom the word entitled had been invented. Our stage was licensed to run events from midday until 10 p.m., but we rarely had a full day's worth of events for punters to enjoy due to the aforementioned incompetence with booking. Still, not our problem. We'll just work with what's given us. On the Thursday, we had scheduled an evening of old-time Victorian music hall, which featured, as a special guest, a very famous film and TV actress. Her performance writer required a grand piano. For some unfathomable reason, and again, due to the incompetence of the organizers, the piano, a full-sized Yamaha concert grand, arrived from the hire company on the Tuesday. This was a remarkably stupid idea for any number of reasons. Due to operational considerations, we had to store the piano in the backstage area where it spent two days suffering in the heat of the day despite our best efforts to shield it. 
As any piano technician slash tuner will tell you, this is an extremely bad idea, especially with an instrument worth close to 100,000 pounds. Almost as bad was the fact that our area was little more than a roughly graded building site. The ground was covered in hardcore rubble fragments around the size of hen's eggs, very uncomfortable to walk around on, even with proper work boots, which also kicked up loads of dust and other detritus. Not the sort of crap you want floating about gumming up the works of a very expensive concert grand. Now, let me properly set the scene. It's midsummer, very hot, and our venue is a large circus-style tent with around 800-seat capacity. The cast of the show, along with our August star, were due to turn up at around 1 p.m. to conduct a production rehearsal so we could sort out sound and lighting cues for the show. The main cast duly turn up on time, and we start sorting out their technical requirements. Pretty simple, and nothing that we're not used to. At about 1.30 p.m., our star turns up, sporting dark glasses and an immaculate couture. As anyone who's worked in this industry knows, the initial interaction with a major A-list star vis-a-vis -vis their technical requirements can go one of two ways, full Monty Diva, or let's go with what we have. Her first demand was that the piano be dropped off the front of the stage so that she could maintain an eye line whilst standing right downstage, both with her pianist and with the audience. The stage was about 4.5 feet above ground level and would have required at least eight early lads to safely shift a full-sized concert grant off the deck. Also not a good idea since it had been tuned that morning and moving it would have almost certainly caused the tuning to go out of whack. I delicately pointed out that doing so would be in direct violation of both health and safety and fire regulations as per our written policy, as it would have put the piano in both the fire lane and close to one of the primary emergency exits from the venue. Thinking rapidly, I then suggested that we place the piano as far downstage as physically possible and that she page herself three or four feet upstage so that she could still glance over and take cues from her MD while still taking in the audience. The tension was palpable. After a few seconds consideration, she replied, No problem, I can work with that. Phew. No sooner than this crisis had been averted than the Docklands rep rocked up. I remind you, gentle reader, that this person had absolutely zero knowledge about how to run an outside event. She had also been a major thorn in our side for the previous week, trying to micromanage proceedings in the venue in order to big herself up in front of her bosses. We, of course, completely ignored her suggestions, but in such a way as made her think she was in charge. Trust me, she wasn't. She had also been inexcusably rude to virtually every single member of the crew from day one and had over the days previously reduced several of them to tears. Production crews don't take kindly to our own being treated in such a cavalier fashion and while we're generally fairly thick-skinned, there comes a point where we want to get our own back. Believe me, after a week of constant abuse, we were coming up with creative ways of disposing of the body. Although we didn't realize it at the time, our savior was at hand, but I digress. Obviously starstruck, she announced in gushing tones that she would be taking personal charge of our star's every need and that we were not to concern ourselves with that aspect. Indeed, we were to keep our place, as we were only the hired help. Our stage manager, who was at that time sweeping the stage, bridled at the suggestion and made as if to use his broom to beat the brains out of this woman. I had to step in front of him as unobtrusively as possible and stop him from burying the woman right then and there. She ain't worth it, mate. She then swanned off, leaving our star slack-jawed in amazement. She then turned to me and said, Is that woman for real? I replied, Darling, you have no idea. At which point she laughed uproariously. I gave our star a brief summary of the previous few days' farrago, and instantly she became one of us 
and from then on, we were all on first name terms. We then ran a full tech rehearsal from 3 p.m. to 5 p.m., sorted out all our cues, and then repaired to the beer tent with the cast for a spot of late lunch and a drink or two. The show was scheduled to kick off at 7.30 p.m. At around 6 p.m., the harridan reappeared to overlook the situation. She noticed that we had all the sides of the tent raised in order to get some air flowing through. Remember, it's midsummer and it's currently low to mid 80s. She then demanded that all of the tent flaps be lowered because she wanted a more theater atmosphere and the light spilling through the side walls would spoil the effect. Despite pointing out that dropping the tent sides would significantly raise the temperature in the venue, she demanded the sides be dropped. So despite our earnest advice to the contrary, we reluctantly complied. At around 7 p.m., we saw eight 50-seat coaches arrive. To our amazement, out from the coaches came an entire flotilla of old-age pensioners, many on Zimmer frames, who proceeded to shuffle their way into the tent across the hardcore rubble underfoot. We discovered later that the organizers had forgotten to advertise the event anywhere, seriously, and in desperation, had gone around to all the local Darby and Joan clubs a couple of days before handing out free tickets and laying on transport in order to have an audience. So now we have 400 odd OAPs frantically fanning themselves with anything to hand as the temperature climbs even higher. We start the show. Everything's going fine, but the mercury in the thermometer I have strapped to the FOH rack is slowly going up and up. It's so hot at the sound desk that I'm down to my shorts. By the end of Act 1, the temperature has gotten up to around 94 degrees Fahrenheit and one could clearly see the old deers are in a bit of distress. Naturally, the organizers had neglected to provide water for the public and judging by the horrified expressions of the two St. John's Ambulance First Aiders stationed either side of the stage, things were about to get a lot worse. I climbed off the tower, found the rigging crew, and ordered the sides of the tent raised. No sooner had I done so than our friend, standing nearby, demanded that the sides stay down because she was in charge and her instructions were to be followed absolutely, no questions. It was at this juncture that diplomacy went completely out of the window. I informed her in no uncertain terms and employing a fair amount of Anglo-Saxon vernacular, that it was in fact the crew who had the responsibility of ensuring the health and safety of all the people in the venue, not her, and that we have the legal authority to enact any procedure that we see fit at any time to ensure the safety and well-being of everyone present. I then informed her that I was now exercising my authority under the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974 to remediate the situation, and that if she made one single attempt to circumvent that authority, I would have her ejected from the venue without hesitation. She then got in my face and screamed, I'm in charge. No strike one, no strike two, instant strike three. I glanced over at two of our security crew who had been hovering in the background with huge grins on their faces, who then stepped up either side of her. Defeated, but complaining like a banshee with a terminal case of hemorrhoids, she was escorted off the premises in short order. By the time Act 2 kicked off, we had gotten the temperature down to a more manageable low 70 degrees Fahrenheit, much to the appreciation of our audience and the rest of the show went off without a hitch. After the show, cast and crew, including our August star, repaired to the bar for a well-earned drink. Moments later, You Know Who appeared and in imperious tones informed us that our star was to be the guest of honor at a VIP reception for the various Docklands bigwigs. With a tinge of regret for having our fun curtailed prematurely, we said our goodbyes to our star. Now it gets interesting. Not 10 minutes later, she storms back into the beer tent with a face like absolute thunder. Taken somewhat aback by her reappearance, we inquired as to why she had returned. 
That woman! She drags me off to this so-called VIP party. I get there, and all that's there are two plates of curled up ham sandwiches and two boxes of cheap wine from Sainsbury's. How the holy heck did she get this job? I gave her a right bloody earful and came back here because I'd much rather drink with you guys. At which point she calls the barman over and orders a round for the entire crew. We spend the rest of the evening chatting away like old friends. She regaled us with stories of her life and she was gracious enough to listen to some of ours. Despite us trying to buy her a drink, she refused point blank and picked up the entire bar tab for the rest of the evening on the basis that you've had to put up with that evil jerk all week. The least I can do is get you folks a drink. All good things must come to an end and at the end of the evening, her chauffeur turns up to take her home. She embraces all of us as old friends. She hugs me, plants a big kiss on my lips and thanks me, whereupon I comment, you have just fulfilled a boyhood dream. Again, that uproarious laugh. She looks at me and says, don't let that freaking jerk get you down. Leave it to me. I later discovered through the back channels some weeks later that our bet noir had been fired from her five-figure job for her monstrous screw-up, primarily because our star's agent had ripped the organizers a new one in very short order. You do not mess with someone of our star's track record without there being consequences. So, although we were not directly responsible for the Harridan's demise, we were gratified to have someone of our star's caliber standing up for us. Revenge is a dish best served cold. Next we've got, not following orders, you're fired. I work six days a week as a painter, not the artist type. This story happened from the 10th of August, Saturday, to yesterday, the 26th. Meet the Spartans. We've got me. We've got hubby, Mike Cliff. We've got JB, Jester Boss. And we've got Karen, my entitled supervisor. Backstory. As some of you know, I got married the 11th of August. I had informed my boss and supervisor of this a week prior as per company rules regarding vacation time for our honeymoon. So just to be sure they understood the situation, I decided to mention it again the day before. They said they understood and told me to enjoy the week off with my husband. And just to be clear, I usually have a nice relationship with both Jester Boss and Karen, but something wasn't right during all this. So I finish my work that Saturday and drive home to make the final preparations for the wedding. We got wed by the same priest that baptized me back in the day and everything went perfect and I couldn't have asked for more. It wasn't the big wedding you see in the movies, mostly because the only guests were my husband's parents and two siblings, as well as about 10 of our closest friends. We finish after some time and we retired for the evening. My husband had during his toast surprised me with our honeymoon destination, Australia. He hadn't mentioned anything about it and he is bad at keeping secrets from me, but we were both happy about it. Since most people think I'm a girl because of my build and choice in clothing, you betcha we got some funny looks in Sydney while being there. We always get a good laugh when they realize. While being in Sydney, I get a phone call. Story time. It was Karen asking me where I was, why I hadn't shown up Monday morning. Karen. Where are you? We have an urgent assignment. Me. I'm in Australia. You know, on the other side of the globe. Why are you there? Who approved your vacation? Well, first of all, it's my honeymoon. Second of all, you approved me taking time off. Well, that decision has changed. You are needed here ASAP. Me, dumbfounded. Karen. Yeah, my son moved away from home and needs his new apartment painted. Me. I'm not the only employee in the firm. Surely you can use someone else. So to clarify, our company mostly hired people without education. I didn't have an education when I started, but took it during my time there but we discussed this for a good part of an hour before I got fed up with her and hung up on her. I couldn't understand why she needed me to take care of the apartment 
when there are six employees that rarely had an assignment and were more than good enough to take care of it. But no, it had to be me. A couple hours later, I get a call from my boss. He's a cool guy and we go out for a drink every now and again, so he knows me. He was even a guest at my wedding. Boss, I got a call from Karen. She told me you were on leave without permission and that you were quite rude to her. Me, as you know, I'm in Sydney on our honeymoon. I requested permission as per regulation and got permission from Karen herself. She called me earlier requesting me coming home to work to paint her son's apartment. I simply got fed up with her and hung up on her. Boss, well, we all know how she is with people. There is a reason why you are the one handling customers. You just enjoy your vacation and say hi to the hubby for me. I will see you in a week. We continue our trip, but every now and again I hear my phone ringing. Guess who? No one in my firm like Karen. She is the biggest power hungry person I have ever known besides my own parents. Since I never shut off my phone, I kept getting calls and texts. Some were nasty, like her personality. Others were so sweet, I thought she was on drugs. I got really tired of her, so I answered the phone again. Big mistake for her and me. I started recording our conversations to try and get proof of her harassment. She started threatening me with firing me and that boss was on her side. This continued for a couple of days, so just for fun, my husband and I start talking about taking revenge after years of oppression from her. So we used some of our time at the hotel looking into her, and I happened to know some stuff about her taxes and regular finances since she asks me to take care of her tax payments. We contacted some of our friends back home to help us. We have some friends in the local police force, and the plan was in motion. Revenge. Friday, we returned home with the biggest jet lag in my life, but with fire in my soul keeping me going. We found some dirt on her during the week. We had enough to use. Because of her union, the firm was unable to fire her because of the certain type of harassment she committed. B.S. My turn to screw her over. My husband and I decided to cut the vacation short so we could start immediately. So Saturday, I clocked in and had a meeting with the guys on my team. We had five ranks in my company. Boss, supervisor, team leader, me, employees, and interns. So I had a meeting with my team to get them in on the fun. No hesitation, they joined. No one liked her, so let the Hunger Games begin and may the odds be ever in our favor. We printed out the tax files I had and collected a total of 150 pages with taxes. We made memes of her sleeping on the job and such, and you name it, we did it. I went to her office regarding the apartment and she lit up like a pumpkin on Halloween. She hadn't noticed me being back at work, so she jumped into the air, but she immediately started rambling about her son and how he needs to get painters out. I said, funny, enough, okay, and finished up preparing. We drive to the apartment to set up, and wouldn't you know who came by? Yup, she came rambling through the hallway, and when she came in, oh, oh you should have seen her face when she saw our fabulous job. We had taken every printout of her tax file, every mail with threats to employees, and basically every piece of evidence against her that we had sent a copy of to the union and glued them to the walls and painted around them like a picture frame. Of course, she would deny everything, but she now had no backup from the union to keep her from being fired. We sent her tax files to our country's CRS, tax evasion. We sent both mails with threats and tax papers to our boss, who, by the way, was in on it from the start. And to top it all off, we got her ex-husband to dig up old files from when they were married, and wouldn't you know, turns out it was some juicy stuff we found. We mailed those papers into my friends in the local police and asked them to let us have some fun with her before they took her. We did. Fast forward to yesterday, the 26th. I got a call from my friends that Karen tried to use me as a scapegoat, that I was the one who made all those papers to frame her since I didn't like her. Well, true, I didn't like her from the start. 
but every file and mail were written by Karen herself. She had no credibility and found herself locked up before long. Just to rub it in her face, I showed it in court with my husband and the entire company just to see what would happen. She was livid. When she saw me and my husband, she immediately stood up, acting like nothing's wrong, and tried to run from me. I don't know if she thought she could kick my butt or what, but even though I dress like a girl and have a pretty small frame and feminine body, I am much stronger than she thought. The court came to a verdict. She was to pay about $450,000 US dollars for tax evasion plus fraud. We found out that she used money from the company to renovate her own house. She got fired by my boss and was to spend three years behind bars because of fraud, tax evasion, and contempt of court. Overall, a really bad day for her. On her way out, she started yelling slurs at me and trying to bite the officers in the neck in pure desperation. This morning when I clocked in, I saw a notice on our board about a possible promotion. I applied on the spot. I went in, had a nice chat with my boss, and got the promotion while still keeping my old position as team leader. My pay got almost triple in a span of 72 hours. I'm happy. Summary, don't mess with newlyweds. Entitled parent tried to use me as an example to her children while I was at work trying to teach them about Megalodon. So I worked at a pretty well-known and popular aquarium over the summer. Usually my job was great and the kids are always enthusiastic about learning about our cool animals and the parents are usually just as enthusiastic. We had the occasional rude guest, but my summer there was great until my very last day. We had a stand at one section of the aquarium where we had cool shark teeth, jaws, and a skull to show kids who were interested. We even had a really cool megalodon tooth that was really popular with the guests. Anyway, enter Entitled Parent and her two daughters. I want to call them Sweet Kid 1 and Sweet Kid 2 because they were genuinely very sweet the whole time and seemed to be getting very embarrassed by their mother. Sweet Kid 1 is the older sister, but they seemed about the same age, maybe 11 to 12. The ages, I think, are pretty important to the story. Now I want to note before I go into it, that Entitled Parent doesn't think she's entitled to any objects or anything in this story. No, instead, she was entitled to wasting my time and tried to make a fool slash example out of me to her daughters. So now, onto the story. They walk up to my stand and I greet them and go through my whole script of what each tooth was, where they came from, talked about the jaws, the number of teeth they have, etc. Things were going great until I started telling the kids about the mag tooth. Sweet Kid One was holding it and seemed in awe of its size and I told her there was no need to worry about seeing it in the oceans as it is extinct. She then asks me how slash when it went extinct and I told her that, well, we don't know the exact year that it died, but it outlived the meteor that killed the dinosaurs as it went extinct due to the lack of prey millions of years ago. She and Sweet Kid One immediately had a confused look on their face and said, Meteor? What meteor? I was a little surprised and said, You know, the meteor that killed the dinosaurs? And they both shook their head. I was shocked as I said, These girls were both almost teens and they had never heard of the meteor. I was about to tell them about it, when Entitled Parent jumped in. She immediately announced, Oh, we never heard of that story before. I asked them what story they had heard instead, and Sweet Kid One excitedly said, The Flood. At this point, I was just thinking, Oh no, but continued on, since part of my job was educating people about our animals and fossils. I told them that the flood they were talking about happened much later than the meteor and that that was the thing that had killed humans. The meteor killed the dinosaurs. They asked how, so I told them it hit the earth and it caused the entire planet to be covered with ash, volcanoes were erupting, etc. and that it made the planet unlivable for a lot of life on earth and things started to die as a result. 
At this point, Entitled Parent starts laughing like the whole concept was absurd. She tells me that, no, no, that is just a theory. So I tell her that actually, we have proof that it happened. There is a thick layer in Earth's crust that has a specific chemical makeup due to the result of the meteor, and that all dinosaur bones we find are in that layer or lower. And she tells me that again, no, that is just a theory. I was pretty taken aback by that comment, seeing as I told her she could literally dig down right now and find the layer I was talking about, and that people have literally seen it with their own eyes. But somehow, it was still theoretical. Whatever, I didn't want to argue with the lady since her kids were right there, and it was clear she was the type of person that couldn't be convinced because they're crazy, but she kept pushing. She said that there is scientific proof that the world is only 3,000 years old, so there couldn't have been a shark alive millions of years ago, despite her daughter literally holding a tooth from one. I told her that actually, no, there's scientific proof that it is millions of years old, and she said, no, that's just a theory. She then told me I should educate myself and read some scientific articles on it. This is where it got even worse. I just said, ma'am, I have read many scientific papers on this topic. I study biology and graduate this year. I've had to read several papers on this exact topic. Entitled Parent Well, clearly you aren't reading real papers. There is proof that the Earth is only 3,000 years old. Plus, no one was alive millions of years ago to prove that it is any older than this. You're looking into the wrong stuff. You should really look into creationism. My blood was pretty much boiling at this point because I had to contain my anger. See, I am considered a cast member where I work and part of my job is to keep up a chipper attitude and smile a lot. So I was trying to do this while also answering this entitled parent's crazy questions and hopefully getting through to her poor kids. So I literally start explaining carbon dating to her. Me. I have looked into creationism. I am a confirmed Catholic and know all about the flood. You aren't telling me anything new. But that would have happened much later than the meteor. And even as a Catholic, I know that there is hard evidence that the earth is millions of years old. We know this because we can carbon date the bones we find. Entitled Parent starts laughing. That's just a theory. Everything you are saying is just a theory. Me. No, actually, it's not. I know exactly how carbon dating works, as I have had to use it in school. It's essentially a mathematical formula that tells us the age of something because we know how long it takes for carbon to decay. Now, this whole time, Sweet Kid 1 and 2 have been standing there with their heads down, touching all the teeth I had laid out for them. When I said this, Sweet Kid 1 popped her head up and said, Oh, like they do with trees? How they can count the rings and know how old they are? I was so relieved when I heard this, because it sounded like the poor girl was listening more to me than she was to Entitled Parent. So I put on the biggest smile I could and said, Kind of, it's a bit different, but it's the same concept. Yeah, we can tell how old things are without being there for their whole lives, just like with trees. These animals don't have rings to count though, so we have to test them another way. This girl was smiling and nodding along and looked super excited about the concept of dinosaurs until Entitled Parent cut in again, telling me how I was wrong and that, once again, everything I was saying was theory. I told her that no, this was not theory. The thing she was thinking of was probably the theory of evolution which, yes, is still technically a theory, though honestly, anyone with a functioning brain and basic understanding of biology would agree that we definitely evolved into being as a species, but that this was not at all the same thing. She just shook her head and violently started scrolling through her phone to find some of her research she said existed. She then became exasperated and turned to Sweet Kid 2 and said, what was that man's website again? 
and then started talking about their pastor's website or a website he had stumbled upon or something. I internally groaned at that one. Her proof was some random website on the internet. That was the proof she was arguing against me with. A website that literally anyone can make. Sweet Kid 2 just shrugged and immediately looked back down and continued to feel the teeth I had out. Entitled Parent realized she couldn't find her proof and just said, Well, there's proof of what I am saying and what you're saying has just been disproved as a theory. So again, you should just look into creationism. I just gave up at that point and nodded and said, I already have, but okay, have a nice day. As soon as she left, my stand got swarmed by a couple new families ready to see the teeth. She had literally been giving off such an aura that it caused other people to stay away from the stand. It was ridiculous. Thankfully, the next family that came over, the dad had a Jurassic Park shirt on, so that at least gave me some relief. I just really hope that those girls go to college for biology or something, or at least learn about these things in high school. Right now, I just feel so bad for them, and I am so angry at Entitled Parent for keeping something so big from her children. I can't imagine what other things those poor girls have never heard of, and I get that in the US we have religious freedom, but making your kids think so ignorant to huge facts and sheltering them to this point should honestly be viewed as abuse. Next we've got Entitled Mom Terrorizes Me For Months Previously on How Did My Life Become So Insane Yes, this is an update. I took my infant daughter out for our weekly coffee date. While there, an entitled mom with her daughter appeared and tried to grab my baby. She left with a broken nose and some criminal charges. I left with BB, my daughter, and a ridiculous lawsuit. Me and my husband go to her criminal court trial and her husband says some really hateful things to my husband. She is found not guilty on most of her charges and is sentenced to probation and some therapy. The civil case was supposed to be on July 9th, but the case was dropped. I was so happy. After months of this crap, I was ready to put all of this behind me and move on with our lives. I don't know why I was so naive. I should have known that a crazy entitled mom like that would not give up so easily. One evening, on my way back from our mommy and me yoga class, I noticed a woman parked across the street from my house. I thought it was entitled mom, but I brushed it off, thinking that I was paranoid because all of this started after one of our classes. I took BB inside and got her settled. When I looked out of the window, the car was gone. I went about my business until Saturday. The weather on this particular Saturday morning was gorgeous, so I decided to take BB to the park. It was still early about 9 a.m. That car was parked on my street again, but this time it was empty. We walked to the park and were there for about 30 minutes before I noticed the same car, again empty. I know it was the same car because of the hideous seat covers, pink leopard print. I was a little on edge, so I gathered up BB and started to leave. Then I see her. She was about 15 feet away from us, and it was definitely Entitled Mom. Entitled Mom was there, but her daughter was nowhere in sight. I was starting to worry that she had moved on to my street. When I got home, it was empty, which is normal because my husband likes to go to the gym a little later on Saturday. I got BB a snack and called my neighbor slash friend. I asked her if she knows if anyone moved onto the street lately. She didn't think anyone did. Neither of us had noticed any sign of a move-in either, not that we pay especially close attention. I told her about seeing Entitled Mom. We both decided that it was probably a coincidence. We chatted for a little while, until it was time for Bibi's nap. As soon as I finished putting her down and went down the stairs, my husband came in. It calmed my nerves to see him, at least until we had this conversation. Husband. Were you expecting someone this morning? Me. No. Why? Husband. I thought I heard someone knocking on the door this morning. 
but by the time I got downstairs, they were already gone. Right away, I was on edge. I thought about that empty car. Even if it wasn't entitled mom, why would someone just knock and leave like that? I told my husband about seeing entitled mom and decided that it could be a coincidence or it might not. So we will keep an eye out and the police on speed dial. Everything was normal for a few days, but then I see the car again. This continued for about a week to two weeks. I would see the car and then it would be back a few days later. It would be at different times and places. I began to feel paranoid, like I was being watched all the time. One day, I tried to confront her, but she drove away. At the two-week mark, I decided that I had had enough and would go to the police station the next morning, and that is exactly what I did. The police handled everything just like I thought they would. By that, I mean that they treated me like a crazy person and told me that a car being on a public street is not a crime. And since no threats had been made, there was not much that they could or would do. It was a great waste of time for everyone. About two days later, I was leaving for work when I noticed that all four of my tires had been slashed. The next weekend, I was working in the garden while BB played next to me. I noticed a little blue-green pellet that I immediately recognized. It was rat poison. I was outraged that the city would just throw poison into people's lawns. What if BB had eaten it? I also have a cat who could die if they ate a poisoned rat. Luckily, he's an indoor cat. I was ranting to my neighbor, ready to turn into a Karen myself, when he told me two things that turned my stomach and left me gagging. One, no one else has or has ever found rat poison pellets in their yard. Two, when the city does rat control, they only put poison in the rat burrows. I wouldn't have them just randomly in the yard. I was horrified. My daughter could have eaten one of those. I called the police non-emergency line and told them what was happening. And again, I was dismissed. My daughter could have died and they acted like no big deal. I was told they would look into it, and that was that. I'm just going to list some of the things that happened over the next few weeks. My garden was torn up by a person who literally just ripped up handfuls of flowers. I saw that car 15 times. Someone set up an automatic wake-up call for my phone at 3 a.m., once I figured out how to get the auto calls to stop, someone would call me and hang up up to three times a day. I would block the number and a new number would call. We went away for a few days. While we were gone, I received a photo text from outside of my house with the message, see you soon. I immediately rushed us home and when we got there, someone had thrown a rock through my window. This was the last straw for me. I rushed into mama bear mode. I took my daughter to my mother's and my husband went to the store and picked up some security cameras. We called the police, took photos, and looked for our cat. He was hiding under our porch. My husband set up the cameras and I filed for an emergency protection order. In my state, when you file for one of those, they go into effect immediately and there is a hearing later to determine if it will be permanent and all that. Things calmed down for a few days, until I brought baby home. I thought maybe the order would keep entitled mom away, because if she broke it, she would violate her parole and spend time in jail. Again, I underestimated crazy. I'm gonna put a trigger warning for the rest of this paragraph, because this is so messed up, so just be warned. If you aren't ready, skip to the next paragraph. One evening, I came home from work and picking up baby, and I walked up to the door. On my porch, there is a black, mostly empty garbage bag. BB was still sleeping from the car ride, so I put her inside the house and came back out. I thought it may have been my husband being careless. I thought it could have been trash or dirty gym clothes or something that he was going to donate or whatever. So I looked inside. Before any conscious thought registered, 
I was gagging from the smell of decomposition. Inside that bag was a dismembered cat. It was warm, possibly from the summer heat. I immediately panicked. I went back inside, crying, calling, and searching for our cat. In my emotional state, I had woken BB, and she was screaming and crying too. Our cat was up in our bedroom, taking a nap, and very much alive. I was so overwhelmed by emotions. I was happy that our cat was okay, but that didn't stop the panic attack that followed. I called my husband hyperventilating as our BB continued to cry. I told him to get home. Now. Luckily, he was already on his way. My husband called the police on his way home, and they arrived soon after he did. They took photos and watched the security camera footage. The cameras clearly showed entitled mom leaving the bag on my porch. We gave the police the footage and the bag. I took baby to my mom's again. I was going to stay too, but I had to clean up my house. The bag leaked on the porch, and in my panic, I tracked it through the house. Me and husband returned home, cleaned up. I also had to have another mill down. We stayed at my mom's overnight. In the morning, I had a meeting with the police, so my mom stayed with baby and husband went to work. The police took my statement and let me know that they were already working with the judge and expected to pick up entitled mom by tonight or tomorrow. I was just ready for this all to be over. I felt powerless. While I was in the meeting, my mother texted me to pick up some teething gel for BB and some toys. So I stopped by the house. I grabbed an extra change of clothes for everyone and the stuff for BB. While I'm in BB's room, I look out the window. It faces the backyard. I see entitled mom in our shed, rummaging around. I flew into an immediate rage and was already halfway down the stairs before I stopped myself. I went back into baby's room and called the police. I told them that someone was breaking in. While I was on the phone, entitled mom walked up and tried to open my back door. It was locked, so I don't know what she thought turning the handle would do. I crept downstairs. I went into my kitchen. I looked out the window and entitled mom was walking towards my back door again. So I moved over and stood against the wall in the back door. I thought she was going to try the door again, but instead, she broke my window. Instinctively, I grabbed the closest thing off the counter. She looked into the door, and I hit her with it. She fell back, and her nose was bleeding again. Apparently, I hit her with a dirty baking tray. She got up and I raised the tray again, but she started to run the other way, around to the front of the house. Just as she made it to the front yard, the police were getting out of their cars. I opened the front door, tray in hand, just in time to hear this. Entitled Mom. Thank God you got here in time. Someone broke into my home and attacked me. Get in there and shoot her. There she is now, and she's armed. Shoot her! When she screamed and pointed at me, the cop immediately pulled his gun at me. I immediately dropped the tray and freezed up. I really thought he was going to shoot me. The cop lowers his gun. Another squad car pulls up and two more officers start getting out of the car. There are a total of four cops in my yard and I'm still frozen. Entitled Mom. What are you doing? Shoot her. Cop 1. Ma'am. I need you to calm down. Another cop walks up and goes to grab my arm. I pull away on reflex. Me. This is my house. Entitled mom. She's lying. Look at me. She clearly attacked me. Me. Because you broke into my window and were coming in. How dare you. I have lived here for years. Me. You lying jerk. I must have moved towards her because the cop next to me grabs me by my arm. I'll be honest, I wasn't thinking really clear. Me. Let me go. This is my house. Entitled mom starts crying. See? She's crazy. Thank God you came when you did. Cop 1. It's okay, ma'am. Follow me to the squad car so I can take your statement. Two cops go with her to the car, and two stand with me on the porch. 
I'm shocked and freaking out, but I start to think clearly again. Me. This is my house. Cop 2. Okay. I can prove it. Finally, not being an idiot. Okay. My purse is inside by the stairs. My license is in there. Cop 2 nods at Cop 3, and Cop 3 goes inside and comes back out with my purse. She goes through it and pulls out my license. Cop 2 and 3 nod at each other, and Cop 3 walks down into the yard and waves Cop 4 over. They talk for a moment, and Cop 4 goes back over to one and entitled Mom. 3 returns over to me. Cop 3. We're sorry, miss. Cop 4 pulled up the police report from yesterday. I'm sorry about the stress. At least she was caught in the act. Blah, blah, blah. While Cop 3 was talking to me, Cop 4 was talking to Entitled Mom. I'm not sure what was said, but Entitled Mom turned even paler than she is and tried to run away. She didn't get far and ended up eating pavement. A few minutes later, I was giving another statement An Entitled Mom was glaring at me as she was driven away. After I gave my statement, and the cops took a few photos, the cops left. I called my husband home again. He stayed and cleaned up and had to board up our window. We stayed at my mom's for another two days. We didn't go home until we found out Entitled Mom was denied bail. In the end, she was found to have violated her parole, so she must spend the rest of her sentence in jail. They also added a stalking charge, animal cruelty, and breaking and entering. I expect that she will be in jail for a few years at least. I really hope that this is my last update. I am also really grateful that so many people showed concern after my last post. Entitled Parent Demands My Healthiest Food For Her Three Kids So my home is known for having tons of kids over at all times. I have a 14 year old and an 8 year old. There are about 10 kids on our block who are in my 8 year old's age range, 5 others in my teen's age range, and I have an open door policy for all kiddos. Every day of the week, I hear from multiple kids, I'm hungry or I'm thirsty. I have never turned a kid away, even though I am very low income. I know that I will be feeding way more kids than my monthly budget allows, so I buy in bulk and lower cost food to feed the horde. For example, I will buy four or five organic apples for my kids to have after the neighborhood kids are gone, but I also buy 15 cheap non-organic apples for everyone to munch on together while they are playing, or nice whole wheat bread for our morning toast with breakfast, but $1 loaves from the discount bread store for bulk PB&J. Enter Entitled Mom yesterday walking up my driveway to about 10 little kids, including both my kids, sitting on my little front lawn, having apple slices, ham and cheese sandwiches with glasses of water. I have never met her before. Entitled Mom. Are you feeding the kids? Me. Yes, they have been playing for a few hours and a lot of them said they were hungry. I'm Expecto Corona. I reach out to shake her hand. Entitled Mom. What are they eating? She ignores my hand. Just some apple slices and sandwiches, putting my hand down. Is that water clean? Yes, I have a Brita water pitcher. Entitled mom, rolling her eyes. That does not clean the water. Next time, give them bottled water. Gestures at random, very sweet girl and two others who are just as sweet. Me. I don't buy bottled. It's pretty expensive. Entitled mom. But you can get all this food? Me. Well, it's not that expensive when you buy in bulk and find discounts. Entitled mom squints at me like I just spoke Vulcan. Discounts? Me. Thinking I'm about to drop a knowledge bomb. Yeah, I go through a lot of food with all my sweet adopted kids. I laugh. Entitled mom scowls. Um, yeah, I get the cheaper bread and cheese and fruit and stuff because it's a lot of extra mouths to feed. Entitled Mom, quiet for a minute. Do you always feed your kids this junk? Well, when it's every day and this many kids, kind of, yeah. 
But when it's just me and my biological kids, we eat as organic and healthy as possible. Well, give my kids the good food too. I really can't afford that. I'm very low income and feeding this many kids is already a bit of a strain. Entitled Mom, raising a perfect eyebrow. Oh, really? You don't have to feed all the kids organic, just mine. Oh, are they allergic to anything or gluten-free? No, I just don't want them eating junk. Just give them your organic food next time, just them. Ma'am, I'm not going to make three plates only organic just for your kids. My kids are eating this too right now, and I just can't afford to do that. Well, if you're okay with your kids eating this junk, just give my kids their healthy food and they can eat this instead. Me, very shocked. What? My 14-year-old coming into the conversation, very sassy to save me. If you want your kids to eat so healthy, you can always bring some of that healthy food to our house to make sure they have it in the afternoons. I can empty out one of my art binds so your kids can have a spot in our fridge for their food. Entitled Mom's voice goes up an octave, or four. Why on earth would I put my food in your fridge? Daughter, if you won't put food in our fridge for your kids, then my mom should not be putting our food on our plates and in our cups for your kids either. Me, turning to daughter, expecto Corona Jr., it's okay, entitled mom. No, let her finish. Daughter, every day your kids are at our house after school for about five hours. You never check on them. You never see if they're doing okay, and you never see who they are with. I didn't even know whose kids are yours. My mom is a super mom, takes care of every kid that walks through our door like it's her own. She will feed any kid that says they are hungry. You should check on your kids, ask them if they're hungry, and if they are, feed them then. Entitled Mom How dare you! Storms back down our driveway, leaving her kids eating on our lawn. Me Aw, expecto Corona Jr., that was really ballsy of you. Daughter rolls her eyes and sits back down on her phone. Fast forward to this afternoon. Same kids including Entitled Mom's kids. Same lawn, same snack. Entitled Mom, briskly walking up driveway. Are they eating here again? Yes, they've been in our yard for four hours. All the kids were hungry. Is it organic? Entitled Mom aggressively points at the plate her daughter is holding. No, it's the same thing everyone else is eating. Entitled Mom. How dare you! I told you, organic only. Me, beyond frustrated. Ma'am, I can't do that. It's too expensive for me to do that. I can send them home if they say they're hungry, if you want to monitor what they're eating. No, if they are playing here, you should feed them. Me, visibly upset. Maybe you should not come over anymore after school then. They have to come here. I have plans in the afternoon and there is no one home. Me, suddenly very sad, realizing how much entitled mom does not care about her very wonderful kids. So basically, I've been a babysitter for you without even realizing it? In that case, they can come over here whenever they want, for as long as they need to be or want to be, and I will keep feeding them and taking care of them, because someone needs to show them what a mother is. Entitled Mom starts to say something, shakes her head, and storms off down my driveway, once again leaving her kids with us. Her daughter is very, very sweet, and my eight-year-old's close friend. The other two boys are just awesome. They play for a few more hours, and then I watch from my front door as they go home to make sure they get into the house okay. We'll see what happens tomorrow after school. Today's Update so, I got home from work today a few hours ago. Entitled Mom's kids were in my yard. My husband was watching them and all the other ones. He handed me the phone. We only have one with service, so it stays with whichever parent is with the kids. 
He laughed at me for all the notifications that went off all day to the point he had to silence them. Thank you all for having such wonderful input and being so concerned for her kids. He then told me that Entitled Mom was at my mom's house having tea with her. I hugged all the children and headed over there. Oh, and I found her and my mother in my mother's office on the computer filling out forms. My mom didn't even let her speak before word vomiting her situation at me. My mom, who is blunt, straightforward, and fearless. Hi, Expecto. This is entitled Mom, who will now be known as Molly. Molly is going through some stuff right now, but she does understand how much of a jerk she was to you. Molly looks embarrassed. My mom. Apparently, Molly got married her junior year of high school to a man 20 years older than her. She was doing a lot of drugs, so her parents let her do it because they thought it was going to save her. She never finished high school, she never went to college, and she has no life experience. Molly looks down at her hands. My mom. Those three precious babies of hers out there were all done with in vitro and donor sperm. Me. Okay. Visibly confused and taken aback. My mom. Well, three months ago, her husband came home from work at local huge industrial company and told her that she and the kids needed to move out because he had gotten a woman at work pregnant, God's way, and that those children were not his because genetically they were not attached to him. He got himself a really expensive lawyer. Me, speechless. Molly, crying very quietly. My mom. Molly had a little money saved from her wife allowance and moved into the neighborhood at the beginning of June. She has no idea how to do anything on her own and what little money she had, she has already blown through on rent, security deposit, and monthly bills that she had no idea how to do because her husband did everything for her. My mom puts hand on Molly's shoulder, squeezing it gently. My mom. So now we are online doing the forms for TANF and SNAP benefits so that she can have a little bit of relief right now, but she has something to say to you. Molly. I'm sorry, Expecto. I never should have acted that way towards you, especially in front of the kids. I know you're doing really nice things for the entire neighborhood, and I should not have been so rude. My mom, actually sipping her tea like a boss. And... Molly. I was a jerk. My mom. When her food stamps come in, we're going to take her shopping to show her how to buy in bulk and to show her how to meal prep for a week. Me. Okay, mom. My mom. So go start dinner. I've invited Molly to eat with us. We will finish up these forms and come over to your house in a few minutes. Me. Okay, mom. So I left and went over to my house made some bread dough for rolls, and popped a frozen lasagna in the oven. Then I hung out on the lawn with the kids and my husband for about 20 minutes until Molly and my mom came over. My mom and husband entertained the kids with some games, and Molly and I sat in our living room and talked. Turns out, Molly is actually pretty nice when she's not in a crazy panic and stressed. It turns out that the appointments she has in the afternoon are her working her first job ever at Burger King a few towns over. She is so embarrassed, she didn't want to say it was for work. She is 44 and has absolutely no life experience, just like my mom said. And her obsession with whole grain and organic food apparently comes from the cook her husband hired who was super hippy-dippy. She'll be able to call the Department of Health and Welfare on Monday or Tuesday about her application for food stamps and cash assistance. I guess she was more of a scared, embarrassed, stressed out parent instead of entitled. I don't think we're going to turn into best friends or anything. I will help her get some resources to get a GED, but I think her conversation with my mom kind of broke her and built her back up. I really wish my mom had waited until I got home from work. But she saw the opportunity, and she took it. Next we've got... Entitled Mom Tried to Smush My Dog Under Her Whale Self Because I Was Moving Out. Story time. I'm the unfortunate spawn of an entitled mom. And because of how she was, I decided to move out when I was 18. 
After a night out, I had just gotten back to a relative's house where I was staying for that week. I plugged in my dead phone. I turned it on and it instantly blew up with texts and voicemails from my entitled mom. Each message got a little more hostile until she was threatening that she was going to call the cops to come get me and she was going to kick me out of her house if I didn't answer her calls right that second. If you've ever called a phone that was turned off or dead, it's pretty easy to tell because it goes straight to voicemail instead of ringing. So I thought it was ridiculous that she expected me to somehow know she left those voicemails on my dead phone. That's not the worst part of this story though. I never called back. I was 18. She was treating me like a child, so I just ignored her for the rest of the night and thought about what I should do. I decided that since she said I was getting kicked out if I didn't answer her call, I should take her seriously and assume that I am kicked out. So the next night, I go up there with some luggage bags. I walk in the house and sit them down, immediately being confronted about them. This was about five years ago, so this is the conversation as I remember it. Some things may be inaccurate. Entitled Mom What are those for? I'm moving out. Note, I was polite about it at first. Entitled Mom starts fake sobbing. Me Goes off to pack my stuff because I'm not falling for this crap. I've seen her do it too many times to get her way. She realizes it's not working on me, so immediately drops the act. She follows me to my room, yelling and screaming, something like, You can't leave me. I'm your mother. You have to do what I say. Me. I'm 18 now. I don't have to listen to you. Yes, you do, little girl. I'm your mom. She used to call me little girl all the time and it infuriated me. I continue to pack my stuff. I'm gonna just call your relative and tell them not to let you stay with them. Let's see how you like being homeless. She calls them and puts it on speaker with this smug look on her face like she thought she was a genius. Relative. Hello? Entitled mom. OP is over here screaming at me and being really rude. I wasn't. She's trying to leave, and I know she's going to come over there. I don't want you to let her stay with you, so don't let her. Relative hangs up. I laugh. Entitled mom starts trying to hit me. I'm defending myself by holding my hands in front of my face, blocking her. Eventually, I lightly shove her away from me. Entitled mom. I can't believe you would hit me like that. Where did I go wrong raising you? Ironic, maybe. I'm still just ignoring her at this point. I get my dog's leash because I have everything I need for a few weeks packed up. Looking around for my dog, when I realized Entitled Mom has grabbed her and ran into her bedroom. No, you can't take everything from me. This is my dog now. I take care of her all day when you're at work, so she likes me better now. I had raised this dog from a puppy since I was 15. I knew if I left without getting her, I'd likely never see her again. We screamed at each other about who really owned the dog. I told Entitled Mom that I always hated her for taking everything from me for herself, that she was a terrible and selfish mother. Entitled Mom got this look on her face like I was the worst person in the world for saying that to her. Then she laid her like 300 pound body down on my 15 pound little dog. The dog started yelping in fear, understandably. Entitled mom. No, you can't have her. She's mine. You're the selfish one here. I don't remember what exactly happened next. All I know was she got up after I said something, still holding onto my dog. She called my dad. Entitled mom. She just came in here yelling at me and hitting me. I don't know what's wrong with her. Come home from work and stop her. Dad said something that distracted her enough to put my dog down, and the dog promptly runs to me. Within seconds, I've got her on the leash, luggage bags in hand, and I'm sprinting out the door. Bye, Felicia. I've only interacted with her a handful of times since then, but I've more stories that came after this, so let me know if you want more. Next, we've got 
Entitled Dad Can't Believe That Science Has Evolved Since 1950 Hey, re-army! Been watching this on YouTube for a while now and absolutely love it. I'm on mobile and English is my first language, so I've got no excuses for grammar. Backstory My dad was in his 60s and had a big ego. Always had to be the smartest guy in the room and was a massive petrol head. Car guy for our friends across the pond. Not long after he retired, I was involved in a work-related accident. My knee was mangled pretty bad and was laid off due to the injury. I had received 1,700 pounds in compensation and my dad decided to take most of it to start a delivery business. It was difficult at first, but it eventually worked out. It ended up being the best time of my life. Every day was a new adventure and I loved it. Now to the story. After two years of delivering goods all over the country, my dad started having problems with his eyes. Couldn't focus. Everything was a blur and all of it was our, the family's, fault. We would keep telling him to see an optician or doctor, but he would insist that he needs his glasses cleaned or needs new ones. During this whole time, he was still driving. We had to literally drag him to the doctor. They did some tests and told him to wait for the report. After a few days, he gets the letter and a diagnosis. He goes pale and orders all of us into the living room for a family meeting. He sits in his high chair with his head lowered, looking like he was about to cry when he finally tells us, Dad, I don't know how to say this, and I know it's going to be hard for all of us. I just got word from the doctor, and it's not good news. He sits there, acting like he has five minutes to live, trying to build up as much drama as possible. Dad, the doctor said that I'm going to lose my sight. We all look in shock and wait for the explanation. Me, what did he say? What was the diagnosis? He looks up and hands me the letter that he clearly didn't read. Me, dad, it just says that you have cataracts and that you have to see the surgeon for a consultation. Dad reacted like I just said he had terminal cancer. Do you realize what this means? I'm going to have surgery, have to be put under general anesthetic, have a bandage wrapped around my head, and be blind for two weeks. That's if I survive the anesthetic. Panic had really set in with him. I just look at him, saying to myself, Really? And finally decided to bust his woe is me BS. Cataracts? That's it? Dad, cataracts is a quick 10 minute operation of which you are awake the whole time. You're not admitted into the hospital for weeks or blinded with bandages. You go home that day. At that moment, you could see the blood boiling in his head and the seething impotent rage built up inside him. He then erupted so loud it would make the eruption of Mount St. Helens sound like an ant's fart. He threw a cup of boiling hot coffee at me, then the TV remote, and anything that he could grab. Dad, what the heck do you know, you little freaking jerk? My great aunt had cataracts, and they had to put her under. The surgery didn't even work. Me, and when was that? Dad, 1953. Why? I roll my eyes. Dad, you do realize that medical science has evolved and developed since 1950. Filled with rage again. No, it hasn't. Just shut up and get out of my sight. You don't know what you're talking about. I leave him be, still cursing me out. A week later at the surgical consultation, he still doesn't believe me and is still ticked at me for telling him the truth. Doc. So, Mr. Dad, the procedure is very simple and only takes 10 minutes of your time, and you will have perfect vision in that eye. We will do the other eye a week after. Dad. So, I'm going to be admitted for a week then? Doctor. What? No, no. You go home the same day. How can I go home the same day if you're putting me under? N no, sir. We only use a local anesthetic to numb the area. You will be awake the whole time. I stand there with a huge grin on my face while the only thing dad can say is, Oh, um, okay. I then lean in 
just to rub it in. What was that, Dad? I'm not sure I heard. Did he say that I was right? He sulks like a child and just says shut up under his breath. He had the operations without complications and had perfect 2020 vision for the rest of his days. And he never apologized or admitted I was right or he was wrong. But I loved to remind him of it every time he loses an argument. A coworker was eating people's lunches, so I ghost peppered them and got them fired. So, I like to bring my own food into the office, and we have a fridge to put things into, and I have my food in tubs with my name on them. A coworker would sometimes not see people's names on food and think it was theirs, so would heat it up and eat it and then apologize. They did this enough for it to be an annoyance, but not enough for our employers to really care. This has been happening with my food for once or twice a month. Last month, I had enough, and I like spicy food, but don't bring it into the office, as sometimes I'll let people try some of my food and my cooking. I ordered a bag of ghost chili peppers and put a full bag into a big pot of chili that would last for several days. I took this into the office and had it for lunch every day. Midweek, my lunch went missing, and I was waiting for the person who was stealing my lunch to get a shock when they ate my lunch. What happened in reality was someone got sent home sick, and the next day they were off and I was told they went to the doctors for stomach pains. Two weeks went by and the coworker who was off refused to talk about it and said HR was involved, so I knew they were going to try to get me fired. I went home and ordered another bag of ghost chilies and made another batch of my chili, this time with only one chili in a single tub. I put this in the freezer and the following Monday, I was told I had an HR meeting that day. I refused and said they need to give me 24 hours to find someone to come into the meeting with me and the next day I had my manager come into the meeting and brought in my, now heated, ghost chili infused chili. The long and short is I was told I could be fired for trying to poison the person who was stealing my lunch and I asked if they admitted to stealing people's lunch, which they did. I then said I have a batch of the chili in question with me, and I like spicy food. My liking spicy food shouldn't stop me from having it at work since it doesn't smell when heated, like fish, and my manager agreed it was on the person who took my lunch without knowing how spicy it was, and I should not be held liable if they eat something of someone else's that doesn't agree with them. My manager and I then ate some of the chili and offered it to the other people in the meeting, some of which tried it and agreed while it was spicy, it was clearly what I liked as I was fine eating it. The meeting ended and nothing happened. I wasn't taken into another meeting and my lunch wasn't taken anymore, but the person who had stole our lunch got a slap on the wrist and was allowed to stay at work. Lunches started to go missing again, so my manager went to HR to say that lunches were going missing and he knew who was taking it and had proof this time. And when they asked for the proof, he presented the meeting record with the line highlighted where they admitted they had stolen lunch and the line where HR had said this was not what the meeting was about. They were fired the next day for theft of property and told they would not be given a reference. Next we've got, boss tries to screw up my promotion and gets fired. Hey Mr. Reddit and Re-Army, first time posting, so not sure how Reddit works. English is my first and only language, so feel free to roast me. So this all happened over a three year period starting in 2001. This is a bit long, but well worth the read. I have an r slash pro revenge story for you. I work in a field that is very small, so I'm not going to elaborate as we all know each other regardless of company we work for or where in the US we live. A little backstory. I live in a warm state and was offered a job in a cold state with the promise of being transferred back to the warm state just as soon as the person they had working there was let go. They were afraid of complications in firing this person, so it was going to take a while to get rid of her. I took the job as once this woman was gone, 
six months to one year max, I am told, I was going to have an entire state and surrounding states to myself with no management breathing down my neck. I get to the cold state and find out they do not have a specialist in my niche. This is important later. So I knew I was going to be busy, which is just the way I like it. Everything is going great with the company for about six months. I get along with everybody. I am put in charge of the night shift. I had about 16 years experience at this time. For those doing the math, that puts me in my mid-50s now. So this was not unexpected. Then they finally fire the woman in warm state, so I think I am going home. Well, if you read these posts, you already know that ain't going to happen. Our cast. We've got OB. Just a guy that wants to live life on his own terms. We've got BB, the CEO slash owner of the company. We've got area manager over all shifts. We've got general manager of all facilities. We've got vice president of the company, works in the warm state. And we've got stupid coworker, gets promoted over me. This is a two for one special on revenge. So area manager has really liked my work up until this point giving me rave reviews, etc. Then, just before the woman in warm state is fired, suddenly, I am getting bad reviews and everything I do is being picked apart from a QA standpoint. We are talking misspellings and personal notes to myself in the system, etc. Well, then the news comes down. The warm state woman has been fired and they replaced her with a new guy to the company due to some deal CEO made with a CEO in a company he was buying out, so my transfer will have to wait. I am given a project to head up back in my warm state as the new guy was just not up to the task. Great. I go back to warm state and meet the new guy. He is a complete idiot. I know this guy is just not going to last, and six months later, yep, he's fired. So now I'm thinking, great my turn to take over the warm state, move back into my own house, etc. As I'm sure you know, this is not going to happen. I have a big fight with area manager about this and go to see general manager to see if we can get this resolved in my favor. The general manager says, No, I have all these write-ups from area manager. I can't have you running our warm state facility. I tell him to read the write-ups and he will see they are all bogus. He does not read them as he trusts his area manager. So I go to see CEO to see if I can get some satisfaction. This company is only about 50 employees spread over three states. So walking into the CEO's office is not a big deal. He gives me the same line as the general manager. So I tell CEO, I'd rather drive a taxi in warm state than stay in cold state another winter. Area manager tells me I am a great employee just not cut out to run warm state. It is September and it's starting to snow in September in this cold state. I am not accustomed to cold weather and have no desire to become accustomed to it. So I gave CEO my two weeks notice and take my two weeks vacation. I moved back to warm state and drive a taxi for the next year or so. It was a totally stress-free job as compared to my normal work. I find out that area manager wanted me to stay because he wanted me to continue working for him and making his area big bucks. While I am driving taxi in warm state, area manager is moved to warm state to head it up. He finds out I have not found a new job in my normal area of business, so he calls me up and asks me if I want to come work for him again in warm state. I say sure, but find out it is for a severe cut in pay, still more than what I am making driving taxi and do love what I do even though it can be a bit stressful. A couple of months go by and I get a job offer in yet another state for more than my regular salary. So I tell them I need to give current employer three weeks notice as I did not want to burn bridges. I tell area manager that I was offered a new job in a different state at a reasonable pay and am giving him three weeks notice. He understands but is not happy about it. Next day, the vice president calls me into his office. VP, why are you quitting? Me, I got a job offer at a reasonable pay in another state and that I just can't afford to live on the salary he is paying me. VP, what if I pay you what you were making in cold state? 
Me. I would stay for that. But given CEO's pertinacity for playing games with words and not following through with promises, I will need the job offer in writing. VP. I understand. I will have the contract made up and we can both sign it. Sound good? Sounds good. Three weeks go by and no contract. I go into the VP's office. Me. Today is my last day. No contract. I will be moving out of state in the morning. I am working at a customer site today. All day. So if you want me to stay, you will need to have it ready when I return. VP. No problem. It will be ready on my desk when you return. Just come back straight to my office. I return at the end of the day and area manager is nowhere to be found. So I go to the VP's office and he is sitting behind his desk with the new contract in hand. Me. Where is area manager? Wanted to let him know that I was back and all went well at customer site. VP. Area manager is no longer with the company. I could not afford to pay you your desired wage and keep area manager. Stupid coworker will be the new area manager. Me. Really? Why not just let me go then? VP. Because you make me 10 times what area manager was making me. It's simple math. So the manager that kept me from going back to warm state is now out of a job and I have my regular payback. But wait, there's more. So two more years go by working for stupid coworker, which is no problem for me. Not the job I was looking forward to in the beginning, but not a bad situation. Then stupid coworker gets married and stupid coworker's wife gets a job working as a receptionist. She's a bit of a jerk, but whatever. I never really have to deal with the receptionist, so I don't care. Until one day, stupid coworker's wife decides that she can tell me what to do. Don't really remember what it was that she asked me to do, just told her I wasn't going to do that and went back to my office. About 20 minutes later, stupid coworker comes into my office. Stupid coworker. When my wife tells you to do something, you need to do it. Me. I'm sorry. Since when did I start working for the receptionist? Stupid coworker. When she tells you something, consider it coming from me. Me. Okay. No. I am not going to do the thing she asked me to do. Better? Now I've told you no and her no. Thing was not in my job description. I decided I needed to make sure this did not escalate, so I made sure that everyone in Warm State Facility knew I was not working for a receptionist, including the VP. Jump ahead about six months, and stupid coworker has been trying to ride me about every little thing. Sound familiar? Well, our little company was being bought by XYZ Company, and VP was looking forward to early retirement as he had a good stake in the company. Stupid coworker then starts calling some mucky muck in the new company on the VP's phone before VP was getting to work. I found out and let VP know what was going on, and stupid coworker was fired that day. Got a call from general manager that afternoon saying I was being made area manager of Warm State. Here it is, 2019, and I am still working for the same place. Sort of, we were bought again. I have moved into a position that allows me to work from home with the same pay and half the workload I had as area manager. Life is good, and I have never seen stupid coworker or area manager again. Remember what I said about my area of business, it's a very small group. I doubt they are working in this field anymore. And our final story of the day. Entitled Dad tries to steal my phone, attacks me when I refuse to give it up, and is met with instant karma. Backstory. The mobile device I use is a Samsung Galaxy S5 and has been in my possession for 7 years now, but rarely does it ever get mistaken for a newer model. I bought it at Best Buy on my 22nd birthday. I'm 29 now. After my last phone, an iPhone 4S, was severely damaged beyond repair due to an accident. A brief background, but it's time to get the show on the road. The cast. We've got me, the quiet, antisocial lurker. We've got Entitled Dad, the first of his name, king of the drunkards and mayor of Stupidville. We've got Nice Kid, he's the polite kid. We've got the bakery store owner, and we've got the police officer. As I mentioned previously, 
This encounter happened just last week in the downtown area of my home city in New England, where everyone knows everyone. Younger neighbors help our senior citizens with daily chores. You get the idea. I always take what feels like a mile-long walk across the city whenever I get bored, but would always let my family know where I was going and always had my phone with me at all times. I went out for a jog from the center of town, over the bridge to the other side. After a while, I had a craving for something sweet and popped into a popular family-owned bakery shop. Bakery shop owner, a lady in her late 40s, early 50s, has known me for 20 years since I went to school with her son from elementary all the way up through our senior year in high school. Because the family knew me personally, they'd sometimes give me a discount whenever I popped in for a visit. Just kidding about the last part, I paid the same price as everyone else. No favoritisms here. I glanced at the display case and ordered a standard-sized s'mores cupcake, a chocolate cupcake stuffed with mini marshmallows. After I paid, I sat down at a nearby table near the front door and pulled out my phone to look at YouTube videos when entitled Dad, mid-30s, and Nice Kid, around 8, made their grand entrance. Nice Kid looked excited to see so many sweets and pointed out which one he wanted. I'm guessing he was in the midst of having a sugar high because he was hyperactive. While Entitled Dad went to order, Nice Kid noticed my phone and walked over. Nice Kid, excuse me, me, can I help you? Nice Kid, what's that? He points to my phone. This? I show him my Samsung Galaxy S5. This is my personal cell phone. Why? Nice Kid, no, I meant what's that over it? Me, now noticing he was looking at my phone cover and had never seen one before. Oh, you mean this thing. It keeps my phone safe in case I accidentally drop it. Nice kid. Cool. He later continued bouncing around and I resumed watching YouTube on my phone when I felt a tap on my shoulder. That's when I felt Entitled Dad's stench violating my nostrils. Entitled Dad. Excuse me, but my son says you offered to sell him your phone but you took it back and said no. Give it to him, now. Me, knowing for a fact it was BS, I shut off my phone. I said no such thing. Your son asked me what, Entitled Dad cuts me off. Don't talk back to me, you little brat. You speak when you're spoken to. Now do as you're told and give him back his phone. He needs it a lot more than you. The way he was yelling had started getting several onlookers' attention, to the point where even bakery shop owner had come back from the break room to see what the commotion was about. Now I have high functioning autism and I hate loud noises, nor do I like being screamed at or touched by people I don't know. So needless to say, I got pretty annoyed and was getting ready to leave anyway. Me. First off, keep your voice down and don't argue with some random stranger. Second, I am not, nor will I ever give your son my phone. I've had it for over seven years and paid for it out of my pocket. Good day. He tried to make a grab for my phone, but I moved my hand out of the way and backed away. We were both roughly the same height, around 5'9", but I weighed 215, whereas he looked like he was 164, so it was pretty easy to keep him at bay for a while. Bakery shop owner by that time had already pulled out her phone and was calling the cops. I walked out but Entitled Dad grabbed me by the arm and spun me around before bellowing the loudest but sloppiest re I have ever heard. Re How dare you, you little jerk. I saw you take my son's phone away from him. If you don't give it back this instant, I will royally mess you up. Me, getting increasingly agitated. Dude, what is your major malfunction? Get away from me. Entitled Dad did not like that and punched me in the face. Now I will admit, it caught me off guard, and I was stunned that this random stranger would stoop so low as to actually hit me in broad daylight. But you might as well start ringing the bells. Ding, ding, ding. Round one begins. The gloves are officially off. Now, under normal circumstances, I prefer avoiding trouble and don't like conflict because of my high-functioning autism and have been taught self-defense as a child and in my teenage years, such as boxing, karate, and Krav Maga, though I never thought I'd actually have to use it until now, 
as a surge of adrenaline mixed with a fight-or-flight instinct took over. According to those who saw the whole thing, Entitled Dad reached for my phone again, but I grabbed his wrist with my left hand and twisted it around before pulling him straight towards me where I decked him in the eye with a right-handed cross. By the time the cops arrived, I had already had Entitled Dad pinned onto the ground where Nice Kid was crying and onlookers tried prying us apart. Police officer had stepped out of his squad car and came over. Police officer. What's going on here? Apparently, that was more than enough for me to snap back into reality and I released my hold on Entitled Dad, who still kept screaming and shouting at me. But when he saw the cops, he tried to portray himself as the victim by telling the officer how he simply wanted me to tell him what time it was, how I shouted at him and threatened his only kid, blah blah blah, and how I should be arrested. All a BS story. Police officer turns to me. Is this true? Me. No, officer. I was just relaxing at the bakery shop, looking at my phone after a long jog until this guy started accusing me of stealing. Entitled Dad. Lies. I saw him do it and he assaulted me for it. Arrest him now. Police officer. Is there any way to identify that the phone here is yours? What kind of mobile device is it? Entitled Dad. Uh, it's an iPhone. Yeah, that's right. It's an iPhone. Me. How many times do I have to tell you? It's a Samsung Galaxy S5, not an iPhone. I hand the officer my phone. Here, officer, I'll prove the phone is mine. There's a lock unlock pattern on the main screen, which has to be unlocked in a particular pattern. Have him unlock it. Entitled Dad looks like a deer caught in the headlights, fumbling, trying to figure out how to unlock my phone. When it became clear that it wouldn't happen, police officer handed it back to me before bakery shop owner sprang to my defense. Shop owner. We also have CCTV footage to prove that OP was not the aggressor and a couple of witnesses to prove it. Police officer. Do you still have them? Shop owner. At all times. Cop turns to me and entitled dad. Wait here while I examine the tapes. It took a while for both bakery shop owner and police officer to come back, but police officer came back outside and slapped Entitled Dad with a pair of shiny handcuffs as Nice Kid's mother rolled up after bakery shop owner informed her what was going on. Apparently, the two were separated and in the middle of a pretty nasty divorce as Entitled Dad was on probation for theft after being released from jail six months ago. This gave Nice Kid's mother the perfect opportunity to gain full custody of Nice Kid. She apologized to me for Entitled Dad's behavior and I told her it was alright. Police officer decided my actions were justifiable as I only acted in self-defense and Entitled Dad was going back to jail. Police officer asked me if I wanted to press charges, but I declined and was free to go. I figured Entitled Dad getting his butt kicked is punishment enough. Entitled Mom refuses to take a number and Hero Mom isn't having it. My God, I saw one in real life and not only did I see one, I almost got my head bitten off in the process. I've been working as a face painter, children's party host since I was in high school. Now, if there's one thing I've learned, it's that the kids are rarely the problem. Nine times out of ten, it's the parents who insist on making my life and the lives of everyone else wanting to get their face painted difficult. So, it's Sunday, and I'm working at the local pub. They've got family day every Sunday. It's a sweet setup. Usually it's a pretty quiet gig, but on this particular day, there are three different birthday lunches booked, and I've subsequently found myself with a line almost 30 kids long. So I pull out the good old numbering system. Each kid gets a number, so that A, they don't have to stand in line for half an hour, and B, so I don't mess up the order. And for an hour, hour and a half, it works. And then, I've just beckoned over this sweet older girl, who's been patiently waiting for over 30 minutes when the screaming begins. And I mean screaming. There's a little girl, we'll call her Banshee, just staring at me and bellowing, while myself and sweet girl's mother, who's been helping me keep the kids in check, we'll call her Hero Mom, are trying to figure out what the heck is going on. Over stamps Banshee's mother. Entitled Mom. 
and it soon becomes pretty clear where Banshee got her pipes from. This woman points her finger directly into Sweet Girl's face and shouts, You stole my daughter's spot! The poor kid looked mortified, so I tried to defuse the situation. Excuse me, but Sweet Girl was next in line. She has a number, and she's been waiting for a while now. Well, Entitled Mom didn't like this at all. My daughter has been waiting since 1 o'clock. It's her turn! Now, I immediately smell BS, because it was around 1 that I realized numbers were going to be needed to avoid chaos, and Banshee was not in the line when I was handing them out, a fact corroborated by the distinct lack of a number on her hand. I try to point this out to Entitled Mom. I'm sorry, but she can't have been, otherwise she would have a number. And this is when crap hits the fan. Entitled Mom Number? Are you that incompetent that you need to use numbers? Maybe if you did your job properly, there wouldn't be kids bloody everywhere, and you wouldn't need numbers. Now look, I've been snapped at plenty of times by disgruntled parents, but Entitled Mom's insinuation that it's my job to babysit her kid really upset me. I moved to inform her of my feelings, but Hero Mom beat me to it. Hero Mom Hey, you do realize that she's not a babysitter. Your daughter doesn't have a number. She's clearly pushed in. OP is painting the kids for free. The least you can do is keep an eye on your own. In this moment, I'm both grateful and terrified that Hero Mom is about to be swallowed whole. I have never seen someone so incensed about something as mundane as face painting. This woman's face turns tomato red, and she proceeds to let forth a barrage of verbal destruction upon Hero Mom, who, to her considerable credit, doesn't flinch, but rather stands there looking just as bewildered as I am. Entitled Mom isn't slowing down, Banshee is still screaming, and the other kids are beginning to get really uneasy. Some of the little ones are starting to look legitimately scared. Sweet Girl looks like she's about to cry, and I've momentarily forgotten how to speak, because, well, the whole situation is so unpleasant, and yet, so very, very ridiculous. And then, Hero Mom has had it. I've only known her for an hour, but already I've figured out that she's a classy lady. In the greatest takedown I've seen since I don't know when, she looks the raging bull dead in the eye and points out, You're kind of rude, you know that? It's like someone has pulled a plug. Entitled Mom stops in her tracks, the steam stops pouring from her ears, and she just stares at Hero Mom, dumbfounded. It's a good 10 seconds before she manages to come up with a response. No, you're rude. And with that, she turns yanks Banshee's arm so hard that the kid almost hits the ground and drags her out of the pub. She's gone, and I'm just left staring at Hero Mom in utter disbelief. Hero Mom So, normal Sunday then? So for everyone who bothered to read this story, I know it's not the craziest story here, but it really got to me. How entitled do you have to be in order to justify making someone else's child cry just so you can cover up your own mistake. Like, this woman was in her 40s, and she decided that the logical course of action, rather than using the situation to teach her daughter a lesson about patience and taking turns, would be to verbally attack the kid, the bystander, and a fairy who was offering to paint her kid's face for free. I just can't fathom it. As kids entertainers, we love doing what we do, but we're not babysitters. If you aren't willing to take responsibility for your own kid, then that's on you. Props to Hero Mom, though. What an absolute legend. Next we've got... How dare you charge me for these not-free crabs? Hey, Mr. Reddit and the Re-Army. I'm new to Reddit and honestly don't know if this will be an interesting enough story, but my friend keeps saying I should post my small encounter with an entitled parent. So here we go. On mobile, English is my first language, but tend to overlook typos, so correct me if you see them. 
The cast is as follows. Entitled Mom, Rude Kid, Myself, and Employee. My friend was there as well as a second child of Entitled Mother, but they aren't important to the story. Note, this isn't actually much of an entitled parent I interacted with so much as observed. This happened about a week ago as of posting, while my friend and I were on vacation in Ocean City, Maryland. Now, there's a store in Ocean City called Sensations. They're literally everywhere there. And they have a deal where, if you buy a hermit crab cage, you get a free small hermit crab. This is important to note. Now, my friend and I had gone to the store on the second to last day of our trip, expecting to get in, get the crab, get out. Well, that didn't happen. We ended up spending a good five minutes just waiting for this entitled mom to finish what she was doing, and it went as follows. My memory isn't the best, so please bear with me. It's also worth mentioning that of the hermit crabs the store has, they have small ones, medium ones, and big ones, as well as those with the painted shell. So Entitled Mom tells her kids to pick the hermit crab they want, and of course, the youngest goes for the painted shell crabs, because they had characters like Spider-Man on them. The employee who was helping them explained to her that the offer was a free small hermit crab, just a plain shell small hermit crab, and her response was that she didn't mind paying extra for the crab her kid wants. So the kids both chose two crabs each. Note, while this was going on, my friend and I were just kind of standing there waiting when I noticed some magnets on the side of a display. They were square magnets and most of them were lined up beside each other, making a neat line and square. All of them were in line except one, which had been pushed up from the middle and was just above the spot it had been in, almost like the start of a checker pattern. Now, I've never been diagnosed with OCD or anything, I just like things to be neat and look nice. So I casually moved the magnet back to its spot, to which Rude Kid laughs and says, I was waiting to see if anyone would be OCD enough to fix that. I just kind of rolled my eyes and said, Yup, that's me, OCD like that. After another few minutes, the family left with their crabs and it was my turn. I took about three minutes totally to look at the crabs and choose the ones I wanted. I got two of them and named them Herman and Henrietta. Anyway, if you've ever been to OC, you've probably seen the hermit crab cages. They're wire with colored plastic and a band that says, My Ocean City Hermit Crab. And that's the cage I got. Whereas Entitled Mom and her kids chose cages that were plastic and more like those critter keepers. When I got to the register, my crabs were moving around, climbing the cage, and were just more active than theirs. An entitled mom told her kids that those were the kind they should have gotten. So they started to go over to change their cages. Now at this point, I had paid and was getting ready to leave, but not before overhearing the entitled mom giving the poor employee who had helped her get the crabs an ear lashing, stating that the crabs were supposed to be free and that she demanded to know why they were charged for them. All the while, the employee had to explain to her many times that she got two crabs that were painted and that the free crab was a small, unpainted normal crab. I don't know what happened after that, but if I have learned anything from watching r slash Entitled Parents videos, I'm sure a manager was involved. Thanks for reading, and I'm sorry it was so long. Next we've got, Sorry sir, we don't fill propane after 8 p.m. And no ma'am, there isn't a set price for a fill. Hi Mr. Reddit and Re Army. Love your channel and listen to it every night at work. Graveyard at a 24 hour gas station. Not much happens, so I get away with it. This is my first time posting to Reddit and I've made an account. So please be gentle on any spelling, grammar or formatting errors. This is more of an r slash tales from retail but can't seem to figure out how to tag it as such. English is my first language. However, spelling has never been my strong suit, but thankfully there's this little thing called spell check and on mobile. These just happened, so they are very fresh in my memory. They're both pretty short, so I thought I'd post them together. 
And even though this will probably not make it off here, Mr. Reddit, you have my full permission to use this in a video. List of people. We've got Propane Guy. Very creative name. We've got Karen. Female dog who was mad because there's no set price for a fill of gas. We've got the not so helpful medic. We've got the poor attendee or purple artist, whichever is preferred. I'm 20, female, Caucasian, working graveyard at a 24 hour gas station. Let's call it Guess So. By law, we're supposed to have two people working graveyard, but nope, it's just me. Not even a manager coming to check in every once in a while. But my boyfriend stuck around for a little after dropping off my phone that I forgot at home to keep me company for a little while. Anyway, about the second hour of this shift and I get this large wave of people come in. A lot of people not from town and not knowing how things operate around here. The first person comes up to the till and tells me to turn on the propane. This is only my third week here. And the only thing I know is that we stop filling propane after 8, which is when we also stop our full service and the gas jockeys go home for the day. Me. I'm sorry, we don't fill propane after 8, and I don't know how to turn on or operate the machine, nor am I allowed to. Propane guy. Just do it. I have a permit. The only reason you guys stop is because you don't have anyone on duty that has a permit. Literally, not even the jockeys have permits. We stop because it's a potential insurance problem. Insurance covers employees, not customers. Me. That may be, but I'm not permitted to operate it in any way, including turning it on. But we should still up again. At 8, I get cut off. Medic. At 6 a.m. Propane guy. All right. Well, I'll just park in the lot and wait for you idiots to pull your heads out of your butts. Our gas jockeys don't get here until 8 a.m. Me. Um, sir, we can't let people sit in the park. Medic. Go right on ahead. After propane guy leaves. There's no need to give the guy bad news twice. After medic leaves, everyone, about four to five people, look at me slightly sympathetically. Except one set of ladies, both relatively nice looking ladies, one of which had grey dyed hair and a Karen haircut. I get a few women come in with such haircuts and most of them are actually decent and will occasionally leave a tip. But not this one. At least not intentionally. That's right, one irate customer after another. Second, no ma'am, there isn't a set price for a fill of gas. Now for a bit of info and understanding. If someone pays more for something than the price, or in this case, the price the amount of gas comes to, and the customer says they don't want the change, or if the customer is fueling up and just leaves without coming back for the change. Anyway, after I finish up with another customer, Karen comes up and tells me she wants a fill. Me. Alright, I'll just need you to leave a card with me, and I'll authorize a fill. Which pump are you at? Karen. I'm not going to do that. Just charge me a fill. And why are you guys the only ones who don't have a pay at pump? Me. We don't have a set price for a fill. And as for the pumps, the owner doesn't see any need to update any of the equipment here. So a lot of stuff is outdated, but in perfect functioning order. Now then, we don't have a set price for a fill, but I can authorize it for a set amount. I just need to know which pump you're on so I can get it going for you. Karen, set it for either 5 or 6. I need to know exactly which one you're on because one is regular gas and the other is for boats and farm equipment. Fine. She goes out and checks and in the meantime her friend who's with her comes up and pays for two waters and hers and Karen's coffees. Karen comes back after moving her minivan and practically rees that they were both mid-marked. Boat slash farm. They weren't. Karen. I'll get $80 on number 9. Alright. Cash or debit? Credit. Alrighty. Ready when you are. She has a little trouble with our card reader and glares at me. It hates everyone, especially me, and sometimes just up and stops working for absolutely no reason. 
Once the transaction is finally done, she storms out. Once she's done filling up, I practically glue myself to the window, hoping she doesn't know how to read the pump. To my boyfriend's surprise, she does. He asks me why I'm so happy, and I respond. Because she only used $79.14, which means she unintentionally left me a pretty large tip on average. Take that, you female dog of a woman. If you made it this far, thank you for reading. I hope y'all have a great day. And our final story of the day. Entitled Landlord Scams Us But Gets Karma When The Next Family Comes Hey Mr. Reddit, I have only just discovered your channel a few days ago. I was hooked and immediately listened 24-7. I suddenly remembered this encounter just last night before mom told me to sleep. I had school, but there was a storm, so mom wanted us to stay. So, here I am typing this while chilling on my bed. This happened about two years ago, so my memory is a bit fuzzy, and sorry if my grammar is horrible. You have permission to make fun and correct me. Cast. You've got me, OP. We've got mom, we've got siblings, we've got dad, we've got awesome grandpa, mentioned only two. We've got the nice worker, and finally, the one and only witch, entitled Landlord. Now, on to the story. So we had just moved to this house behind our grandparents when I was about 13. I'm 15, about to turn 16 now. It was big and affordable. It was the house my parents wanted. It was the place me and my siblings dreamed for. The houses we usually live in were small. I even had my own room with a lock too. Privacy is a big thing for me. We were all happy. In comes Entitled Landlord, a short old lady with a resting evil face. Me being a bit of a jerk detector, just by looking at her, I could tell she was gonna be a nightmare. She was nice and welcoming at first, but I could smell the bull crap from miles away. My suspicions were confirmed when nice worker was called after some concerns from my parents. Entitled landlord insisted on hanging around to help. She was furious with nice worker for no reason over something so small as a wire. Entitled Landlord. What is this wire? She screeches while pointing to a wire. I'd never asked for a wire. Nice worker. Ma'am, please calm down. That wasn't installed by me. It was installed by another worker years ago. That really set her off. Entitled Landlord. <gasps> I don't care. I want it out. Out. While nice worker was taking a break from working, I had gone up to him with a cold water bottle. He smiled and accepted it. Me. I'm sorry for the way that lady treated you. You're not to blame for someone else's work. Nice worker. Problem. I feel bad that she's gotta be your landlord. She's crazy. Me, joking around. She needs Jesus. He got where I was getting at and laughed. She really does. When Entitled Landlord starts coming back in, I scrambled to get away as soon as possible, and I could hear the crazy lady yell for him to get back to work. After that day, I was scared of her. I'm a very shy person who gets easily intimidated, and avoided every time she wiggled her way into the house. Throughout the months living there, I noticed she was nosy and came every week to see how we were doing. I was very uncomfortable with this and so were the rest of my family who lived there. Entitled Landlord demanded gifts from Mom for letting us stay, which Dad got angry about and nearly went off on that jerk. One day, when she decided to pay a visit again, I was outside of my room drawing, one of my favorite things to do, and she decided to sit next to me, which made me uncomfortable. She started up a conversation and I had no way out. This was the conversation. Hello. Hey. What are you drawing? Her voice was sweet, but dripping with poison. It is what made me even more uncomfortable. Me, as polite as I can be. Well, I saw this character from a show. I thought it would be nice to draw the characters. Oh, what talent you have. Thank you. Eventually, the conversation started getting nosy. 
she started asking for a whole life story and repeated this line a lot. It's not like I'm some stranger. You can trust me. I just wanted to get out of there and to save the day, my parents came in. They didn't look angry, but you could sense their anger when they found this woman talking to their daughter. More days passed and she becomes more bossier than ever, raising the rent bill and making us become so short on money we could barely afford food. Suddenly, while me and my siblings were still asleep, mom burst into our rooms and told us to get up and start packing. Me and my siblings panicked. Soon enough, mom set us down and began to tell us what was happening. Mom, entitled landlord decided to kick us out after selling the house to a company so her son could move in. When mom told dad, here comes the god of anger to cast his power to him. But luckily, he was able to calm down. This is where awesome grandpa comes in. He got so angry, he told her off and put her in her place. I remember it like yesterday, but for reasons I'd rather keep this PG. We finally moved and thought that was the end. A few weeks later, a different family moved in. Not her son. The entitled landlord was actually stealing prized possessions from this family and was arrested. We also learned she was a scam artist and didn't actually sell the house. She was charged for that too. So not only that family's justice was served, so was ours. And shoutouts to our Regenerals of the day, Liam, Sol Chibi Gacha, and Jennifer. Become tomorrow's Regenerals by leaving as many Rees as you can in the comments below and please listen to my playlist every night when you go to sleep.